Uh, let me begin by just saying how, how truly grateful I am, uh, Miroslav, that you are here and for the honor of having you here. Um, your life and your writing has meant a great deal to me personally and has been the source of tremendous um, in challenge and fascination. I think partly it's biographical and the work that you've done that has so deeply integrated uh, your own particular narrative and the story that is mapped against that of change in Eastern Europe and around the world is really enormous. My life, uh, I think, was really particularly changed by two of your books. Uh, first, certainly, Exclusion and Embrace, um, but also The End of Memory, which for me was one of the most important books that I've read in, in many, many years. So I'm extremely grateful for both of those two things. It's funny to have an opportunity to do this because what, the first time that I ever had an opportunity to share in a certain way a platform with Miroslav happened at a National University Graduate Student Conference where I was uh, had spoken and Miroslav was going to be a respondent to the final address and just before that happened he had to leave and with three minutes notice I was asked to step in as the respondent to the lecture that had uh, was just about to be done. It was literally closing and suddenly I'm supposed to step in and be a respondent. Uh, on this particular occasion it didn't happen that there was any explanation of the fact that I was just stepping in to do this so it felt a little awkward to me when I got up to the platform to do so. Marva Dawn had been speaking there. Marva's a marvelous speaker, and, and one of the stylistic things that she did was to suddenly intone in plain song various texts that she was going to then expound upon in her address. And this had been the source of some uh, amusement, especially among students that knew nothing about plain song and couldn't quite figure out why this woman was suddenly just singing uh, in, in what they understood to be a monotone, uh, a text in various ways. So uh, I got up and I <clears throat> said, you know, it's a great honor to have an opportunity to uh, respond to the person who had just spoken. Uh, but in the spirit of Marva Dawn, I feel compelled to begin with a text in the same way that she began with a text, and this is my text. I have no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> and here's what's more, I can't believe I'm standing in for Miroslav Wolf. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> And then I said, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And they responded, thank you. <laughs> this topic is an extremely important one for many uh, reasons. And it was practically brought home to me this morning because just before this event, I attended the Pasadena Mayor's Prayer Breakfast. This is an event which apparently traditionally has been a rather evangelically flavored event and very uh, decidedly Christian only. But this year, it became a multi-faith experience, and there were representatives from uh, Jewish faith, there were representatives from Islamic faith, and there were many others who were present in the room, all of which were not only just acknowledged, but really incorporated into the program. It simply, in a very pragmatic way, expressed something of the flavor of the world in which we live and the importance of these issues. One of the things that I have loved about what you've done this morning, and it feels a bit like you're just sort of taking a breath before, in a way, the major uh, presentation of tomorrow that brings all of what you've said today into conversation with globalization, is that it expresses that in a world of such uh, teeming difference and such profound uh, values and perspectives owned by these world faiths, that in fact it's just extremely important that we take seriously the complicated challenge that it is and to find some way by which to negotiate the challenge. What I think you've outlined this morning in a very descriptive way is simply the experience of, in a way, laying out a kind of architecture for how world faiths could be understood. And the six examples that you gave of these six qualities which are shared in common are a kind of major architecture within which the practices of faith in any given house of faith uh, end up being lived out. And it's in that large architecture that I think what you've pointed to in these six characteristics of world faith, I think is given uh, tremendous help. I've never heard this particular list, but lists like this that are trying to describe not some kind of common core, as you said, but instead a kind of environment of expression and commitment, which we share through these points of this architecture, I think is a, is a very, very helpful tool. 
It is, as you say in the manuscript, uh, a bit like preparing a big table in which there's an opportunity to be able to bring what you bring quite distinctively as a person that comes from a particular tradition with these six points, for example, in the context of the Christian faith, and to invite others to do likewise, owning your own tradition while engaging in a project which has elements that are common to the enterprise that you all share. And I think that's a very, very helpful thing. It's not to try to create some sort of great religious soup or stew, that's not at all what you're suggesting. It's not to draw lines or boundaries in order to create defenses uh, either. It's rather, I think, to indicate what is possible and honoring to our own tradition while pursuing a way of diminishing hostility and violence and misunderstanding, uh, if not also war. So what I find helpful uh, about your effort is to suggest a way of holding even our quite different accounts of what is true, uh, and as you say, that's an extremely important debate and set of concerns, what is true and good while remaining or growing in our close contact with one another. This is the challenge. How do we remain distinctly and truly ourselves and engage in a non-hostile, non-violent way with our neighbors in contexts in which that challenge is going to be fraught with all kinds of difficulties? I've appreciated very much this uh, sort of galvanizing theme out of the Christian tradition that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord and the particular way in which we understand the relationship between uh, the transcendent and the mundane is obviously pertinent to all of that. The question I think that it raises for me that I wanna just explore a bit is in light of this architecture, where is the architecture placed? This is, it seems to me, is part of where the argument and the issues become uh, increasingly complex. The architecture itself, of course, is by no means just theoretical. It's related to places and times and people and traditions. But in another sense, it plays out in very specific contexts. And it's in those contexts where this architecture certainly becomes clearly no longer just an enterprise of, of uh, very thoughtful and, and important reflection, but a place of collision. I think, for example, in places that I've visited where there are, is a hostility of architecture between faiths you could start in Jerusalem and go from there in physical manifestations in which the architecture of the faith actually intersects with and is built on, over, under, with, beside, against other architectures. And that's where the analogy of coming to the table seems right, but as you know far better than I do, that table is anything but a clean and smooth table. It's fraught and often chaotic. These are the places, it seems to me, where the, where the challenges come and where you're going to move tomorrow, I'm sure, with issues of globalization, is the fact that these things end up only raising the bar and the challenge of engagement, I think, even more. One of the things that many secularists would suggest <clears throat> is that you can't really talk about religion in today's world without almost automatically feeling as though you have put a placard of bigotry across your forehead. The very nature of making a religious claim seems to suggest to the minds of many secularists and even some of other faiths that if you, in fact, make a religious claim, erect your architecture and make an affirmation of its uh, importance, that the claim of bigotry is uh, immediately on the table. The suggestion that anyone dare make any claim and that that claim should somehow be respected may be legitimate in a kind of postmodern way, but in any personal terms, it easily starts encroaching on the sense that you're being pushed against by the people and the institutions and the places, the ideas, and particularly the religious institutions that are around you. I admire deeply and applaud and want to encourage anything and everything that you're doing that has to do with bridge making. And the significance of that is, to me, uh, the large enterprise that you're engaged with. I want to just ask, as that bridge is built, for whom is it built? And how does, does it get crossed by ordinary people whose intellectual structures and whose patterns of life don't begin with these six qualities, but begin in a very um, much more mundane context? This is, of course, again, as you know, uh, better than most in the room. That is where the rub actually comes. So the architecture seems extremely important. It seems uh, useful, it could be contested, but I think broadly speaking, it seems to me that you're giving us um, very helpful handles on how to approach that level of conversation. But the question that it raises for me is the, the question, what would it require of self-conscious, self-critical Christian believers to live into that architecture and to make use of that architecture in the context of, 
of the interaction that occurs with people of other faiths and with other faith uh, ideas. If ordinary life, as, the, uh, as globalization makes so clear and modernism makes so clear, is really so important, then let me just reflect for a moment about some of the ordinary life dimensions of this architecture, which I think make working out its implications particularly fraught. And again, I'm just naming perhaps what we might know, but it seems to me nevertheless valuable to bring it uh, to the conversation. To have traction with this architecture uh, seems to me to need to then consider several other concerns. The first is the, the role of passion in religious faith. One of the things that I think is so uh, profound about my own experiences in various parts of the world uh, and experiences of multi-faith in this country as well is the way in which r religious devotion and commitment, world faiths or uh, local faiths, are filled with deep, amorphous, profound passion. It attaches to a level of emotion and reflection and commitment and devotion, which just makes the image of a table of conversation so difficult to imagine because you come to the table already so laden with a passion of your own uh, tradition and your own religious experience. I think, for example, of a time when in a very unusual way, I happened to be traveling on a highway that had been closed in Bangladesh uh, because of, a, of an enormous uh, Muslim festival that was occurring. There were a million people in prayer, all uh, dressed in white, all responding to the person who was giving direction and stretched out across the highway and across uh, many, many, many fields. There was, according to the Dhaka newspaper, a million people at this festival on that particular day. And at a particular moment, when everyone was face down, kneeling in prayer, they opened the road so that the car that I was in and the several other cars that were driving could pass through this field. It was an unforgettable moment of literally driving through religious devotion, where in this image, this sea of all of these people, there was a deep sense of their responsiveness, a crowd of a million, utterly silent in that particular moment, and then us driving through. It was a moment of feeling and seeing what I've seen in much less dramatic crowds of the depth of religious devotion, where people in some cases had walked days in order to be there to express the significance of their uh, impact. And therefore, the architecture feels to many, I would fear, a remote and distant fact that is disconnected in, from the practice of their faith in ways that would be difficult to integrate. Is this not also, of course, very much a part of the response that we've seen in recent days, whether we're thinking of the world vision controversy or whether we're thinking of, of other controversies uh, that have occurred in recent days where the social media hypes the nature of this conversation so much that the possibility of even acknowledging that there is an architecture, that there may be commonalities, just seems almost impossible in many cases to actually arrive at. Second thing is, in addition to the place and, uh, and consideration of passion, is the place of power. It seems uh, to me to uh, imply perhaps that to work this architecture in a meaningful way implies a maturity that it seems to me would be uncommon for many, not least in relationship to issues of power. So much about our human experience is shaped simply by our own uh, experiences and, and placements of power, our sense of power or powerlessness. This is the nature of what causes religious devotion in, for many, and it's also one of the things that most clearly underlines the significance of, of how power is understood and negotiated in each of the various world faiths. This is where I get very nervous uh, for the trajectory of how conversations around world religions and world faiths and globalization can actually interact. I think that you are asking for each tradition in the best sense to live up to its best use of power. That's how I would understand the architecture. That's the right way for such architecture to be presented. But when I stood in Hebron, as I did a few months ago, feeling the intersection in collision and anger and hostility between Jews and Muslims and Christians, it was a collision of power. The architecture in that case, again, physical, which was also political and which was also religious and theological, was a power collision that you could find at any of the checkpoints in that small town. 
it was for me a little microcosm of the difficulty of the challenge, also its urgency, but the question of how that, the framework that you've suggested and the questions of power get negotiated, it seems to me, is really extremely important. How do we move from one to the other in a way that's going to somehow give it a fair account and a respect and deference in which we hold our power open-handedly without abandoning our tradition or our truth claims. Those are just complicated issues that are part of that rich debate that you referred to. Thirdly, and related really to the first two, is the, the place of fear. So in addition to the place of passion, the place of power, I think the other thing that makes the table so complicated and messy is the place of fear. Fear in part simply because of history. Fear because of the way in which this long, long-standing collision has already been so vigorously played out, so we don't come to the table neutrally. Clearly, your own narrative has made that evident. What is so striking about your narrative is your willingness to deeply move into its significance, to allow the theological and spiritual questions that it has raised to be, to be nurtured, reflected upon, developed, and maturing in your own life, and to call us into that same exercise. That's part, at least, of how I engage your reading. I'm so grateful for that. But it just is also a diagnostic description to say that is a very unusual thing. And therefore, the question of how it is that we negotiate the table in the context of such fear, so if we could acknowledge the architecture, passion is at the table, power and its complexities are at the table, and an enormous amount of fear is at the table. At a level uh, that I'm, I would sense would be so high, I'm not sure that many ordinary Christians would see the connection that I think you're trying to point toward in finding this commonality of, of architecture while acknowledging nevertheless uh, the distinction of each of our faiths. So it leads me to simply ask in the midst of this, uh, finally, what is the place of love in this paradigm? It's at the core in particular of the Christian tradition I would want to speak only at the moment out of that. And to say that whatever it is that this negotiating process and this conversation is about, it must in the end be an ex experience and an expression of what the scriptures say is the character of God's great, extraordinary and gracious love. How does that inform, guide, shape, challenge, enable us to move uh, from this architecture to, uh, to the reality. Let me close uh, with this one story. When I was a pastor in Berkeley, uh, there were perpetual demonstrations, of course, in Berkeley that was part of the spirit of the place. And uh, there was a period when uh, there had been two weeks of demonstrations on Sproul Plaza, the main plaza of the University of California, which were uh, held forth under the title of the anti-Islamo-fascist celebration. You can imagine there was a lot of passion, that there was a lot of power, there was a lot of fear, and there was very little love on the plaza of those two weeks. At the very end of this uh, week of hostility that was mostly between uh, Jews and Muslims, there was a woman, a Christian student that was part of our church and part of the wider fellowship of, of other Christian groups on campus, who had been very deeply immersed in this, believing that as a Christian, she needed to be exactly in the middle of the anti-Islamo-fascist week as a person that was seeking to both uh, learn, engage, and serve what was clearly a very hostile and difficult table where uh, the combination of factors made the, the uproar of those two weeks very, very intense. After the week was out on the final uh, day, something occurred which was described the following Monday morning by the rather cynical anti-religious editor of the Daily Cal, the University of California newspaper. And it provokes me, uh, as it did when I first read it, to just ask again about, in addition to the, passion, the place of passion, power, and fear, about the place of love. And the convergence for her and for some that day came about in this way. This is how the editor wrote it. I con conclude all of this, his summary, that is, of this anti-Islamo-fascist celebration. I conclude this by ceding the floor to my friend, Tinley Ireland, who gave for my money at least the best speech of the evening. Just as the sunset shining right into her face, she stood up on the steps of Sproul Hall on that same consecrated spot where earlier in the day and throughout the last two weeks, the fear-based communities had shouted themselves hoarse about the people over there who are just waiting, waiting to get us. She stood there and she told us about her faith. 
She talked about how the hardest part of following Jesus Christ was to love, and to love not just her friends, but also her enemies, to stop having enemies. At the end, she asked in the, everyone in the crowd who did not believe in Jesus who, as the Son of God to please raise their hand. Almost every hand, as far as I could see, went up, rejecting her cl central claim. My own, he said, went up. She smiled, and as the light faded, she simply and truly looked at us and said, I love you. He goes on, I've been on the receiving end of a few punches in my life, but nothing ever hit me that hard. I don't know exactly what kind of politics or religion or philosophy that is, but whatever that is, where can I sign up? <laughs> we will now uh, give Dr. Wolf an opportunity to respond to the questions, the presentation, and then we will open it up for questions to you. So where can we sign up? <laughs> right here. There we go. Altar call is here. Yeah, yeah. The buses are waiting. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for this response, for the uh, questions. Uh, I think they're, they're touched the very heart of what I was after and in some ways point to uh, kind of places where it will either succeed or it will fail, and succeed and fail not simply at an intellectual level of construction of a proposal, but uh, succeed and fail at the level of uh, lived uh, lives and practices uh, of people in everyday uh, kinds of uh, environments. So what partly drives what I was trying to do, what I'm trying to do, is a uh, sense, a prevalent sense that you articulated, and I think well, one of your early uh, comments about religious faith and bigotry, and more than just bigotry, somehow sinister character of religious faith is being assumed. That is to say, more you give yourself to faith, the less likely you're going to be able to contribute anything to uh, the common good, especially in uh, the good uh, understood as common with those who uh, disagree with you, who have uh, other kinds of uh, faiths than you uh, do. Um, and my, my sense is that actually this is quite mistaken, that deeper, Im in, uh, deeper immersion into not just the Christian faith, but also other faiths, in fact, will help lead or redeem, so to speak, the religion, the faiths, from multiple captivities in which they are, they find themselves. Again, I'm not leveling uh, religions. As I said, I'm a Trinitarian Christian of a certain stripe, and I'm happily, happily so, and I'm ready to contend for the truth of the faith, right? And truth is very important to me in, in, this, in this whole thing. But nonetheless, even, even so, um, I think that the major causes of religious conflicts are actually are not religious. I think they're, they're economic and political. Um, and I think the kind of construction of faith in such a way that it aligns itself easily with uh, certain kinds of political causes and certain kinds of worldly goods that we pursue is the most significant factor contributing to the bigotry and to the negative effects that faiths have in the world today. And that's true of the Christian faith. I think that's true also of other faiths as well. And uh, one of my goals was then to indicate that it, it is this actually two worlds account of reality, our very significant contribution to the world peace, if you want, if that's what we are interested in, apart from the, the question of truth. 
Uh, and it's significant because it relativizes the struggle for the worldly goods. For instance, it makes such virtuous contentment much more possible. We live in a world, uh, I, will, I will talk about it tomorrow uh, a bit, we live in the world of impossible contentment. We all know we should be content, but we have no idea how to be content. And when we think that we are content, we fear that we are losing something really significant, right? And so we're malcontent about our struggle to being content <laughs> because we've been uh, brainwashed. No, I don't know whether that's the right term. Uh, we've been habituated into thinking in certain kinds of patterns in terms of what we, uh, what we need and what progress means and what our flourishing uh, means. I think world faiths have an important contribution to make in this regard. Also in regard to relationship between faith and political realm and nation. Worse for the faiths, I think, is association with political power. Um, and um, a good deal of violence can be a, a, a ascribed to this. So, so that, that, that's the roughly where I'm, where I'm trying to head with it. Obviously, there are many constraints that needs, need to be placed on faith so that they can, they can uh, proceed in the manner which I am suggesting. And I think two major ones is, uh, I, I think the freedom of religion, freedom of faith has to be there. And uh, some people say, well, this is a Christian kind of uh, invention. And I think Christians have proudly emphasized freedom of faith from the very, from the very beginning. But I think it's, in, it's characteristic also in the important ways of all world faiths. All of them are at the, at the center. And this is the whole, was the whole point of uh, world faiths addressing individuals, uh, not members of a particular group. Addressing individual means that it presupposes that each individual has responsibility for the general direction of their life. And that responsibility is a presupposition of possibility of the world faith and therefore must be affirmed by every world faith. And if you add to that uh, a golden rule, which I think most faiths in one way or the other, maybe silver rule or whatever else you can describe this. <laughs> uh, there are varieties of versions uh, st stronger or weaker of this, but roughly they end up uh, uh, going in the same direction. Uh, some form of golden rule combined with this uh, sense of freedom, I think also is part and parcel of those world, world religions. That makes it much more possible to imagine than how a conversation between them can take place. But then your really important questions come after this. <laughs> and those are the questions of passion, those are the questions of power, questions of fear, and then ultimately of the kinds of uh, love that we exercise. And maybe all three previous ones are summed up in the mm -hmm. question of love. And I'm thinking uh, when I read this uh, passion or desire or power, fear and love, I'm thinking of Augustine, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of Augustinian sense that uh, our loves are those that determine the kinds of lives we'll lead and how we will, we will relate to others. Mm -hmm. I, I think religions are dangerous because they are not simply intellectual edifices, uh, because they are lodged in the depths of our hearts, but they also give us potential because of that, right? Mm -hmm. they are, they're just because of that able to transform realities. And I'm thinking, um, globalization processes, I won't have too much time to talk about this, but, but globalization itself needs taming. It needs framing and taming, needs curtailing who is and how it is going to be done. You can't do it with head knowledge uh, alone. You have to do it with something that shapes practices, motivates kinds of passions and establishes communities of, of action. And so I think uh, schooling of desire is what I would think that world faiths are. Certainly Christian faith is uh, as well. Clearly this is again kind of ideal case scenario or I am looking at potential that world faiths have and not the misuses. Uh, I'm aware of those uh, as well. Um, fear for instance also. Um, it was brought to my attention when I was walking with a friend of mine in the streets of Sarajevo and it was after the war and mosques were popping up in Sarajevo, and he's a Franciscan monk. And he told me, Miroslav, you know, this is not about religion, these mosques. This is about fear. This is about marking territory. Uh, this is ours, and the mosque proves that it is ours. 
And then he said, we fear each other because Christians are doing the same thing, just 100 kilometers uh, down south in Mostar. There's this huge, humongous cross that was placed on the top of a mountain. And it's the same mountain uh, from which, uh, from which uh, 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 Serbs have shelled Mostar, right? And now instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, weapons of war, there's a weapons of, weapon of the cross standing there and kind of dominating the whole uh, landscape, right? It's marking territory. It's not worshiping crucified. It's marking territory, right? And why do we mark territory? He said, we mark territory because we fear each other and we do not fear God. Again, the primacy of the transcendent over against the kind of the mundane and relativizing of kind of the mundane relationship that we have, which comes actually then to the good of these very relationships them, themselves. Um, and that partly also attends to the question of uh, an issue of, of power. Um, uh, there is power in the blood. <laughs> Right, we sing, and there is an incredible power in that um, love of the enemy, which was uh, instantiated in that best of the speeches uh, that to which you uh, referred. Um, there is power in uh, marginality, uh, but there is power in kind of masses mobilized around some some goal, and I think we have to thematize those and uh, reflect about deployment of power as religious, uh, as religious uh, folks. Um, how it is that in the context of contested spaces with power cursing in different directions and uh, stronger and weaker facing each other, how it is that um, we as religious people, we as Christians, can deploy power in responsible way. There's no way of going away from power. There's only a way of properly deploying power and the right kind of uh, power. So those are some of you in response to your challenges. Those are some of the challenges that I see and uh, I, in a way, uh, in a broader project, I try to attend to. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, we are now going to open it um, to you. And uh, we do have a mic in the front here, and I would ask uh, you to come up and uh, put your question into that mic. And because of the size of this sanctuary, uh, it might be good if uh, those of you who intend to pose some questions to queue up at least in a few numbers at a time so we can be efficient with uh, our use of time here. So please, would you please identify yourself briefly and then uh, pose your question. My name is Oscar Owens from West Angeles, Church of God in Christ. I have enjoyed all of the presentations this morning. Let me ask you a question, uh, Dr. Wolf. You talked about how all religions, world religions, address the issue of the ordinary life, uh, even when we have transcendent concerns. How do we legitimately, as various religious groups, define and talk about a commons, the common, the common concerns of us as communities? Is there a way to continuously talk about that and interact about that for the benefit of uh, better ordinary life, or must we continually be re relegated to um, choosing transcendence and forgetting about the common life or engage in creating a commons that we can agree upon even though we have differing views about what that might mean. Yeah, that, that, that's what I try to um, express with, uh, with a sense that various world religions are concerned, a kind of integral part of them is a concern for ordinary life and uh, given their universal scope uh, and uh, principle of reversibility, uh, which is expressed in the golden rule, uh, there is also, I think, embedded a concern for a kind of common spaces and shared uh, aspects of not simply individually pursued, but, but common, uh, common uh, 
uh, spaces uh, and common goods that we need to uh, pursue. Of course, it, it'll, th those common goods will be contested. That, I, if I understand correctly, what the contestations among world religions are, rarely are there, occasionally they are about uh, theological issues. Uh, and even when they're about theological issues, they are about uh, kind of legs on the ground uh, effects of those theological uh, issues. And my sense is that if there are those commonalities among faiths, I think it makes negotiation of common, what is common to us, um, much more possible. Uh, I don't think it solves things. I think it simply provides a framework uh, for negotiation. I don't think we can resolve the issue of uh, life together without conflictual character. I think conflict is embedded in the very character of human interaction. It happens in my living room all the time between my voice and myself. Uh, that's fine, right? We don't, we don't necessarily, something, and it's sometimes actually very good, were there not a pushback against me as a father by my teenage son, I might have not been as good of a human being. Um, um, uh, if, if there weren't, that weren't the case, right? So I, I think the contestations itself are, okay, we, we need to figure out how to pursue them. And I, I'm hoping that we can provide, have a framework even though, or rather just because, also because we uh, advocate and espouse different religions. Understanding that I think human conflict is, you know, with us, but it seems to me that we, we seem to be talking around the margins. And that is, isn't there a fundamental issue that separates religions? And that is, is human dignity derived from God or derived from your belief system? And I have societies which treat people of different religion differently because they do not acknowledge that all individuals are made in the image and likeness of God regardless of what you're believing in. And the minute you have your religious belief system as a criteria for human dignity, you will never solve any problem. So you're referring, I presume, to uh, John Winthrop's Massachusetts Bay sure. Colony? Sure, Or... Or the Wahhabi in Saudi Arabia. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is Wahhabis, but I think as Americans, maybe the first thing should come John Winthrop. Oh, absolutely. And then one realizes, right, that, that actually the contrast between uh, our beliefs in God may not be such great. A lot, a lot of people I hear make the argument like that, say, well, Christians have this inherent dignity, but, but Wahhabi Muslims or Muslims don't, right? And I don't think that's quite, that's quite right. And so my sense is that you have variety of religions that in their own way can assert the dignity and, and reason way it lies grounded, I think, in this fundamental sense that each individual person has a responsibility for the direction of their, their lives. So that the kind of religious freedom that's an endemic in all world faiths structurally, I think, not always lived as such. For instance, for centuries in Christian tradition, absolutely not lived as a religious faith, right? You have to think that it took, it took Catholic Church until the 60s of last century to embrace idea of religious freedom, right? Uh, so religious freedom has been contested for so many, so many years, but I do think that it's kind of endemic to the character of the of religions and therefore they also the idea of dignity of individual human being. Well, but I think even at that point, I mean, if it takes you 1965 years to figure something out, it's not embedded. And that it's this sense of, and it's part in my tradition of a baptismal vow that we respect the dignity of every human being, totally apart from religion. And I think that's the key, is that if dignity is in any way hinged by belief system, you'll always be fighting because you create the other, always, if dignity is self-derived. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, you. You, you, you might, right? But I'm not sure how else you could identify dignity unless via a belief system. I do not think that I have dignity because I have certain beliefs, right? I have a dignity because God created human beings in God's image. 
And whatever belief system you have, this is where your dignity lies. But for me to justify dignity of human beings, I've already invoked uh, a religious, religious belief, right? So it's possible that different religions might have different ways of justifying human dignity, but actually, in fact, the dignity from my perspective of every human being is rooted in the sheer fact that we have been created by God as those in the image of God. Thank you. Your lecture and uh, your response, Dr. Lambert, tonight, that was very enlightening. Uh, several years ago, my wife and I spent some time in Nepal, and we were visiting a holy site, a stupa, and a prayer site. And I was approached by a Buddhist evangelist, the young man quoted himself being. And he wanted to share with me the claims of Buddhism because he felt as though it would be appropriate for my life as a Christian, so I could remain a Christian and hold to Buddhist beliefs. And this idea, though, hit me as this morning I'm listening to both of you, and I realized the claim of Jesus, though, at Matthew 28, the Great Commission, calling us to lead people to discipleship in Jesus Christ. And so now when I think of the discussion both of you are uh, bringing up, interacting, building bridges, but to what purpose? Is it to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and salvation, or is it simply to, which would be a good thing, to build bridges of friendship? I'm not saying that's bad or anything, but I just wonder, how does that interact with our calling as Christian believers? Um, I think it, it connects really well, at least for me. I, I don't see any, in anything that I've said, I don't see anything that would call into question uh, the great commission to bear witness to Jesus Christ. Um, I think in some ways, uh, kind of step, two steps removed, what I do here is bearing witness to Jesus Christ, not directly, but indirectly. And I, I think that, um, I think one that that's uh, inherent in the character of the Christian faith. So it is in Buddhist faith, by the way, right? Um, but it's inherent in the character of the Christian faith. Uh, and we ought to cheerfully bear witness to this amazing fact that in Jesus Christ, God has come and revealed God's own being to us as an unconditional love. What can be better in the world than that? You know, I'm, I'm uh, put me in front of people. I'll evangelize, no problem. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I see them as, as part and parcel of the same thing. They are different parts of the conversation, but I think they're, they're for a Christian, I think it's one conversation. It, it's uh, dependent on which audience and at what stage of the conversation are you engaged. I think that's the variation rather than a different purpose or a colliding purpose or a forgetful purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wolf, in your lecture, you referred to several occasions on the other religions also uh, adapting or incorporating democracy. Also, you referred to the idea of religious freedom. And also, a uh, previous question talked about human dignity. These are, the, I think, the important terms uh, in global society because these are, in a sense, public languages. Uh, so my question is, in a way, the way uh, you describe religion has world religion has a unique understanding of transcendence and mundane reality. But I believe each religion has a different development or self-understanding, even capacity, how to relate transcendence and mundane in public realm. Because public realm is not just private mundane realm. Uh, when that third realm or mediating realm, that public realm is not fully developed theologically, also within religious community, I think religious people make all kinds of mistakes. That is, either they just escaping to the other world, world, taking just transcendence as the total reality, or just, they just are trying to bring transcendence to the world using their own power or theocratic approach. So in my observation, that's the area, going back to Dr. Leverton's you know, approach, yeah. 
that fear and the power, passions are infiltrated. So my, my question is for religions to approach those you know, categories, uh, democracy, human dignity, you know, human rights, eh? how, how we Christians help develop, you know, uh, on the one hand, public theology, on the other hand, public virtue. You know, how can we encourage Christians you know, to be uh, both Christians and citizens together in, in, in global so, uh, society. I think that's the first task we need to engage before we talk to other uh, religions. Me? <laughs> that was yours. <laughs> that was mine, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the so way, way I see it is that um, the basic distinction is transcendent and mundane or this world. Within mundane, there are varieties of um, spheres of life, you might say. There is a private realm, there is a communal realm, there is public uh, realm or a variety of publics. And I do think that religions, Christian faith certainly, has developed varieties of ways in which to address those uh, individual spheres. Uh, and they need to be all properly addressed. And I, I agree with you that especially relationship between, uh, within religion, relationship between transcendent realm and the rule, uh, that is to say state uh, and public realm in that sense, is, is a very crucial, crucial one. Um, I'll try to address that in, in my lecture tomorrow. Um, yeah, that is my choice. Thank you. Uh, just we, we have about 10 minutes left, and uh, if we can keep our questions brief and uh, be able to accommodate all of you who still have some. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Jillian Granham. I'm a student here at Fuller. I'm really interested in what you were saying about the role of human dignity and particularly the role of democracy in religions. And it seems that, um, particularly in thinking about women, many religions have not as only part of their practice, but it seems very deeply embedded in their theology, a secondary role for women. And so I'd like to ask you if you could speak to that and particularly in relation, relating that to the idea of democracy. Yeah, I, I think women, uh, yeah. all world faiths, all faiths in general, which is to say all human systems uh, that we've had for quite a long time have not been equally friendly to men and women, right? Um, so my question is, is more this, do world faiths have a potential for inner transformation so that the equal dignity of all human beings can be, that therefore also men and women, can be respected on the grounds of that faith itself? Uh, and I need to then distinguish between uh, what I want might describe the inner logic of faith and varieties of expression that it finds in throughout its history, but also in some of its sacred writings. We make that distinction, obviously, when it comes to the Christian faith. Uh, there are statements in the Old Testament, there are statements in the New Testament that are not particularly egalitarian, and we are all aware of those, and hermeneutical challenge for us, us was to interpret uh, properly those passages con uh, in conjunction with others, but also in conjunction with a, a kind of reading of the logic of the faith itself that's faithful to the character of faith. Now, my contention would be that world faiths, uh, just like Christian faith, had this potential of redeeming fully its uh, possibilities with regard to equality, equality of women, uh, just like Christianity had, so also other faiths uh, have uh, as well. Um, obviously, that can be contested, and you'll find in the Christian side of things uh, and, and other faith side of things, people who will, uh, who will push uh, uh, either way. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm betting that I'm right. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll accommodate the four 
questioners that are standing there, and then we will draw to a conclusion. Thank you, Jeff, please. Thank you to both of you. Uh, brief question, wondering, well, the observation would be that <clears throat> Dr. Labberton's points all pointed to characteristics that can be thought of individually. You talk about world, vision, uh, world religion as touching the individual, and so even though we wouldn't want to trap it in individualism that we see in the West, uh, the observation would be that some of these issues have to do with the individual's sense of self and sense of belonging to the right group, et cetera. The question would relate to this. Um, I still think we live in a world where the United States is confused with Christianity. Uh, to some extent, certainly in the Arabic world, I believe Israel is confused with Judaism. And I'm wondering if you could address the extent to which any type of thinking about world peace could address that confusion, which I believe has wreaked havoc in many ways. I'll do so tomorrow. Is that Thank good? you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for standing. It's, very, you. it's a very important issue, indeed a crucial one. Yeah. Good morning, doctors Wolf and Leverton. Mark Burns, Manitou Press. Uh, Dr. Wolf, you emphasize that all religions, including Christianity, have a component of personal or individual responsibility. And Dr. Laberton, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds as if you're pointing out practical roadblocks to implementing an architecture as you have created, Dr. Wolf. And I'm wondering if it's possible from either of your perspective that such an individualized concept of religious identity may not in fact be a barrier that keeps an architecture that could be so fruitful from being practically implemented. Does that question make sense? In other words, it, 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 uh, yeah. can you say the last sentence one more time? Does such an individualized religious identity that has as a, a primary component personal responsibility rather than communal identity itself, practically speaking, in terms of implementation, an obstacle? for an architecture such as you suggest being fruitful? I think that part of what I was trying to get at was not so much indiv an individual expression of those things, although it certainly plays out in those terms, uh, but really a, a marker that could just as truly be said, those four questions that I was raising belong just as much to a community as they do to a, a set of individuals. But to ask your question, uh, or to try to respond to your question, do I think individualism, uh, as we practice it, ends up becoming a roadblock to this architecture or many other such architectures of attempting to try to understand what peace and justice mean in the world? Absolutely. And that pervades uh, cultures and, and human experience, tribes and religions uh, all over the place. So yes, I do think that that's a, a roadblock. And, I do think that it requires a willingness to grow in maturity and in identity with a, with a community that's much greater than, than we are typically prepared to actually do, especially, I think, in the West. My sense would be also that, that addressing an individual, which is what I said that world fates do, could be taken in individualistic ways. And indeed, we can give examples of individualist forms of religiosity, right? But need not be taken. And we can also point to much more communal uh, forms of religiosity, both in terms of how individual is being nurtured to make that fundamental decision, but also into what that decision, what kind of community that decision is being, this being made, right? And so I don't think that responsibility for my life as an individual, I mean, I die, nobody can die for me. Nobody can be born for me. Nobody can set the direction of my entire life for me, right? That is not individualism in my understanding. That's a part of human condition and we can see that either we can, we, can, we can construe this either uh, as being inserted into a community, supported by a community, or we can take it simply as kind of naked individualism who then 
individual who subsequently goes into the community. Um, so I guess that's what I would, I would differentiate between the type, types of relationship that, that transcendent realm has to the individual from individualism as we exercise it in certain domains of life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lamberton, Dr. Wolf, my name is Carlos Robles, and uh, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And everybody and with here you is too. Uh, I'm a pastor in Walnut, and uh, w Dr. Wolf, correct me if I'm wrong, but what would you say to someone that uh, I was challenged by one of your statements? I could be wrong. This is what I heard that um, the problem of religion is not so much. Uh, it's not so much a problem of truth or religion, but it's more political and economic. I think I've, that's what I heard you say. And, but if, if economic and political issues are man-made, and I look back to Genesis where God set the terms of uh, faith and acceptance before him as one is faith, and you see, without politics, without economics, the first murder and man committing violence against his brother. And uh, where they take issue at that it's not at the root truth and uh, who Jesus Christ is. Uh, the Jews crucified Christ because of his claim. And the Muslims, as far as I understand, they do not believe that he's the son of God or that he rose from the dead, or that he even died on the cross. So what would you say to someone that says, I, I don't think it's political or economic at the root? Well, you, you know, I, I don't know what the root is, right? Uh, unless you say the root is human captivity to sin. Right, but what the concrete, situationally defined root of the conflicts are, my sense would be, they're not monocausal. They're multi, they're not monocausal. It's neither just politics, neither just religion, neither cu nor culture, uh, economics. It's multiple forces together. My point is that if you simply separate religion from particular com interests, uh, I think you will misunderstand what's going on. You'll uh, misunderstand also why Cain killed his brother Abel, if you think of it simply in religious terms. Um, that's not to say the truth of faith is not important. Uh, to me, it is. But it's to recognize also that often those who have the truth of faith are capable and have historically committed um, quite significant atrocities. <laughs> yes. So, but you're not leveling all religions, are you? No, I'm not. I'm not actually, uh, no, see, uh, what I'm saying is that all religions make claims to truth. I think that Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God, and therefore that the truth of humanity actually is expressed in the God incarnate, who is Jesus Christ. I, I, as I said, I believe in the Holy Trinity. I believe in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Once you do that, uh, everything's, uh, you've got to swallow the whole thing. <laughs> thank, thank you. And we'll take our last question. Thanks. Um, thank you, doctors. Uh, my name is Guillermo Pupo. I'm a student here at Fuller. And uh, the question is for either or both of you. Um, I will use uh, Dr. Laberton's analogy of architecture and if we're saying that these six commonalities of world religions uh, may be the pillars for negotiation um, and conversations, my question to you is, uh, how do you see the, the role of worship as, as a platform or ground for spiritual progress to facilitate a conversation between these religions?
Yeah, worship is a particularly complicated question. I think Mark is uh, going to be able to say more uh, about, about this than I am. Um, but I don't think that conversations are just conversations of the kind that we are having here uh, around this table. I, I think conversations of with common engagement, I think conversations are um, uh, around common projects, <laughs> conversations around common practices, uh, all sorts of things of that sort are also important as are more intellectual theological conversations that happen. Go with, uh, as we have done when we organized the Common Word Conference with uh, some of the leading uh, Muslim clerics, go picking uh, fruit in the orchards around Guilford and you've got, uh, got a great opportunity for doing something commonly sharing common humanity in reaching for something that's sustaining all of us and also opening oneself for understanding the other person and also implicitly for conversations about more theological uh, uh, or philosophical or ethical types of, uh, types of issues. Um, I think the same can be said of a particular worship practices, though I want to be very sensitive about worship spaces, what is implied in them, and I think I'd defer to Mark to say something about those things. Who would now like to defer to Todd Johnson, <laughs> but I will uh, say something. I, do, I would understand worship to be our expression of response to our ultimate reality claims, right? Whatever it is that we are claiming is supremely true, um, and our response to that is what we would call a life or an act of worship. It takes so many different manifestations, and it's absolutely true that it is around those places, those buildings, those sites, those practices, that some of the greatest religious hostility uh, actually exists and the greatest misunderstanding actually exists. So what I would say is that in the context of this morning's conversation, it's actually in sometimes having opportunity to engage with one another in, in issues and practices of worship where we begin to actually understand the nature of what's really being claimed by the other person in a way that we may not if we stand simply outside it and think of it just as a sort of theoretical structure as opposed to a response of a person's life or a community's life. So I think actually engaging there can clarify, and I think the, the architecture that, that Dr. Wolf was uh, recommending or suggesting is one that we can use to actually help us understand it and even unpack what it is that we're seeing and what our response to that will be. There will be places where that collision will be real, and then the question becomes, what do we do out of that? And I would, as a Christian, I would simply hope that one of the things that it would do is that it would lead us to even deeper, more loving and genuine engagement as opposed to um, either uh, ideological hostility or a rejection of the other because they don't actually share our experience. I would think instead the gospel calls me even more deeply to truly engage in, in the experience and understanding of a person's life, our community's life that's different than my own or our own, and that, that it's actually my worship that specifically calls me to engage them in, a, in an act of concern for truth, mercy, and justice, and, and I'm wanting to embody that as I engage even in the moments of intense collision. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask if our panelists want to briefly give a final word to either uh, their interaction here in front or to the questions that have been asked. Either of you want to give a final word for this? Uh... It's kind of heavy burden to do the final word. Um, um... So may, maybe maybe a word kind of that motivates and frames uh, these, but also others, other endeavors, and of which the reality of which what I'm trying to do here is is an expression, and that's very much tied to my own sense of the nature of God as a kind of generous love as revealed in Jesus Christ. And once you put it in those terms, generosity of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, um, it would seem to me that you can robustly affirm your own convictions 
and yet do so without begrudging others to have something that's similar to what you have, or sometimes the same, or sometimes even better. Because you can then see how it is on account of this generous God revealed in Jesus Christ that whoever has anything that's good has that which is good just because of that relationship that he or she has to Jesus Christ, or rather put differently, on account of the relationship which God has revealed in Jesus Christ has to them, even if they might not know that. That opens up the possibility of generosity without danger of sacrificing any of the deep convictions that we hold. And if anything guides my engagement with world faiths, it's this type of conviction, uh, which I think is the beauty of the Christian faith. I love that response. And my uh, final word would simply be to say that that would be a, a vision that I would want to affirm and that in my role as president at Fuller and I think about the task that we have of shaping future leaders of the church, it's toward the end that we are forming people who have the capacity to exercise that sort of uh, response to an affirmation of faith and a deep generosity uh, of a spirit in response to the generosity of God in Jesus Christ. That would be a remarkable thing if the hallmark of our life as a seminary was the, the formation of people who went out to live and lead in ways that reflected that kind of spirit. That would be to be making a remarkable contribution. And it's needed in this domain, but it's needed in many other domains of topics that we could also turn to. And that seems to me to be almost a, a, a particularly fitting end to this part of our discussion, as though it is almost like a charge for what we as an institution are really committed to doing. Mm. Thank you. Join me in thanking our panelists.